All right, so chapter two looks at the process of social work research. Uh, we'll kind of give an overview of how you can take a complicated social problem and break it down into a measurable question um, and kind of the different processes and components that go into coming up with a good research question, which is really half of the battle of coming up with like a good way to develop an intervention. So social work research questions, basically we'll be talking about identifying social work research questions uh, that can come from personal encounters. Uh, you might be working with individuals and um, over time it might become frustrating for you that you're working on individual problems and you realize that there's really like a larger, more of like a systematic type problem that's causing all these individuals to suffer or have these day-to-day uh, -day problems. So um, based on your personal experience, you might want to look at uh, certain types of like program type questions or policy questions. Or it might just, you know, be a simple type of intervention for improving resiliency or finding other types of resources. Uh, professional experience, academic discussion, uh, maybe some course that you've taken or classmates or coworkers that you've talked to have kind of challenged you to think of a social problem that you'd like to address or a social work research question. Also, sometimes public re published research can uh, stimulate people to come up with further questions about what they might want to study for uh, a social welfare type of problem. So for this course, specifically for graduate students um, who have to come up with their own type of literature review, you might come up with a, a broad type of question um, that's really, really covers a lot of ground and eventually kind of gradually develop into like a more manageable, um, tighter type of research question. So you might start off with something that seems like a great research question, but it might become more refined along the way. Um, I can tell about a personal experience or writing my dissertation. I had a very, very broad question and through doing my literature review and seeing what's already been done and like what might be out there, I realized that some of the things that I set out to talk about had already, already been described by other people, um, which helped me to narrow my problem down into something that I was more able to take on myself. Uh, so refining your question is just something that's natural because you want to come up with something that's workable, testable, and narrow enough. I, I can think of plenty of examples where people have kind of like cast their net a little bit too far and the question gets a little bit more murky. Um, something about how to solve homelessness um, you could think of as being a problem that's way too large versus if you broke down something just providing shelters for a certain type of population help to reduce the number of reincidences of homelessness. Um, you could think of something a little bit more narrow like that that you might be able to test um, rather than something so broad or multifaceted as homelessness in, in general. So when you're evaluating your research question, you would want to ask yourself, what's the social importance of this question? How is answering this question really going to benefit the field of social work or society as a whole? What's the scientific relevance? Is this something that's been done already? Is it really going to advance the field of social welfare uh, by trying to answer this research question? And then lastly, the feasibility piece of it. I know pie in the sky, we would like to think that we all have unlimited resources. But unfortunately, in the world of social sciences as a whole, lots of times we're working under limited timelines with limited budgets, um, limited resources, and we have to figure out something that's feasible and have aims that are kind of within that realm. So when creating a research question, uh, you should be aware of personal biases. And I think it's always a good idea to have an idea of what your worldview is and how that may impact the way that you're doing your research. So within the field of psychology, I know that we really take a hard look at what our own implicit biases are and what our worldview is. And people who are more aware of that are a lot less likely to act biased because of it. Um, so certainly we all have our own worldviews that impact the way that we look at social problems and the more that you're aware of that, the more insight that you have towards it, uh, the less likely you are to be biased. Also when creating research questions, I think it's important to be aware of weakness-based language. Uh, oftentimes we look at people's deficits and kind of look at all the problems that may uh, exist within a community or within, a, within an agency or whatever it may be. Um, I, I would encourage you to avoid using weakness-based language and kind of look at more of like sources of resilience. Um, and, and really sources of strength within a community. Um, also being aware of demographic stereotypes. I think it's important to be aware of 
any type of stereotypes that you may hold towards a certain type of group. And we all like to think that, you know, you know, we're all enlightened individuals. But again, I would say I would challenge yourself to look at some stereotypes that you may hold about uh, a certain group. And certainly we've, we've all probably been guilty of having biases and, and from social science research that's been out there. We can say that we all kind of develop some types of schemas to understand the world around us. And um, just because of limited time and resources, we develop stereotypes just kind of naturally. Um, so it doesn't mean that it that you're a bad person or anything like that. Um, so I would just encourage you to be honest and open about what types of stereotypes or beliefs that you have about certain groups or individuals, specifically if you're going to be researching um, or conducting social research within a field, even if it's a group that you belong to. Um, sometimes people have stereotypes about groups that they belong to, and for better or for worse, it, it's good for you to really look at that and see, is this really impacting the research that I'm doing in any kind of way? And if so, what do I need to do to kind of address that so that I'm not acting biased because of it? So some of the foundations of social welfare research, um, searching for literature. One of the key terms that you're going to hear here is peer-reviewed literature. Um, so it's important to look at peer-reviewed literature because um, online you might be able to publish any kind of article that you want without really too much pushback. Uh, but peer-reviewed literature means that other people within your field that are respected and knowledgeable have edited the paper, reviewed it, uh, made sure that it's up to par with the the scientific standards within the field. And the peer review process is pretty lengthy and intensive. So when you're looking at a peer reviewed article um, within a strong journal, you'll be able to tell whether or not it's something that you can really put a lot of weight on into um, and determine whether or not it's a quality strong article or whether it's more of like an opinions based article where there might be a little bit more noise in the data. Also using the internet to your advantage, man, there are so many databases out there where you can put in just about any kind of key term and you'll find thousands and thousands of hits and being able to sort it in any way that you want. Not to discount libraries or librarians because it's still a super valuable resource and the UWM library is incredible. Um, so I would take advantage of that. But it's certainly in a day and age where we've got Google Scholar, PsycInfo, and a whole plethora of other options for searching for peer-reviewed articles, it's good to know how to use those. Also reviewing research, uh, the kind of capstone for this course is looking at uh, a critical review of research within the field, whether it's an individual article for undergrads or a full literature review for graduate students. I'm hoping that you can walk away with some confidence in being able to look critically at the research that's out there and kind of uh, come up with your own opinions on the quality of the research and maybe areas where it's limited, areas where there's strengths, and what might be able to be improved in the field. Some steps in searching for literature is coming up with a specific research question. Again, that's something that we'll be talking about a little bit more later on in the semester is helping you to identify a specific type of research question that you'd want to answer. Um, identifying appropriate databases. There's a, a several really great databases out there, um, which we'll be talking about when we cover literature review a little bit more in depth. It's good to come up with a broad keywords list, but also, I mean, if, if you come up with a broad list of keywords, also being able to narrow them down into something that's a little bit more manageable. Um, so if you get too many hits, maybe narrowing it down. If you get too few hits, maybe broadening it a little bit. Also, Boolean search terms, inserting and or not within your terms. So if you wanted to search for CBT interventions for children and adolescents, not adults, that can help you to narrow down your research a little bit more or your search terms a little bit more focused. You'll also want to use appropriate subject descriptors um, describing the population that you're really hoping to search for the research on checking your results and finding the articles. Uh, so when I, I'll post a video of how to search using the UWM library um, and some of the better databases out there. Some articles are going to be super easy for you to find and you can just click on the PDF, but if you can't find them, the library system here is excellent at finding them from different libraries and getting you the PDF and emailing it to you. So um, another great resource to all UWM students that I still kind of take advantage of to this day. So when coming up with a literature review, 
Um, there's a multiple step process, but at least when writing it up, you want to describe and assess each article separately, review the implications of the entire set of articles together to write a literature review. There's going to be some example papers online of how you can do this, but after you search and come up with a big list of different types of papers and research articles, you'll want to look at them as a whole body, but like describe them individually and kind of how they relate to each other, how they compare and contrast. Maybe several people have looked at the relationship between trauma history and homelessness, um, and you might be able to compare and contrast what articles um, talk about that might be related to each other and may agree in some areas and how they may contrast in other areas. So um, you might find a body of literature that says that there's a strong correlation between previous trauma and current homelessness, um, and other people may not find such a strong link or maybe find homelessness needs to further trauma or whatever it may be. Um, but being able to look at the literature and consume it both individually, article by article, but also as a whole body and kind of being able to talk about how they all relate to each other. So writing the literature review, um, a literature review's background on social issues, obviously, um, leading in an introduction to the problem, a summary of prior research, along with a critique of prior research, so talking about its strengths, limitations, maybe just beyond like a symbol, like sample size, um, demographics. I think just in most research, um, you would wish that there'd be a larger sample size, longitudinal data, a uh, more diverse sample within the population. But a lot of times there's limitations to the design and you might find that an author is making a really strong claim based on kind of weak data. So it's important to be aware of that and presenting a conclusion based on the summary of all the research that you've found, uh, which will be like your discussions and conclusion section of your literature review as a whole. So some of the implications for evidence-based practice, um, if you're coming up with evidence-based practices and you're more interested in clinical work, um, looking at a systematic review of a specific type of an intervention for a specific population, you should be able to look at the evidence to see whether or not there is support for such an intervention for the population that you're working with. You can use such databases, the Campbell Collaboration or Cochrane Community. Um, these are both great social work resources that provide a bunch of peer reviewed literature on best practices for social workers. Uh, there's also government supported resources that are out there. I will also talk about a few other ones that aren't on this list that I think are probably pretty good. And a systematic review is also ultimately going to help you to integrate a scientific methodology into literature review process, kind of taking a scientific approach to looking at all the literature that's out there and kind of coming up with an idea of better information um, about the likelihood of an intervention being successful for the population that you're working with. So more specifically, there's a Campbell collaboration. Um, this is the website link. There's education, criminal justice, social welfare, research methods, all things that you would be very applicable to the research that you're doing. Um, also, the Cochrane community has uh, more focus on healthcare and mental health. There's also government supported resources, such as the National Registry for Evidence Based Programs and Practices, NREPP, um, provides descriptive information, rating of research quality, rating of ease of implementation. So you can search by areas of interest, outcome, location, and it really helps you to specify the type of question for the population that you're intending to work with. So theory, you could have a whole course on this and I'm just gonna give kind of like a broad overview of theories provide additional framework and ideas to test and evaluate. So posh, popular theories within social work, um, you might think about like behavior theories. There are certainly old school behavior theories that look at conditioning and uh, rewards and punishment and like a second wave cognitive theory that looks at the way that we're thinking and how that impacts behavior um, and even like a third wave more of like an act-based approach which is more of like a third wave behavior of acceptance and commitment and cognitive flexibility also a few other resource mo mobilization theory resource dependency theory human capital theory um, these all give us good theoretical frameworks to work from and kind of help us to link together a body of research in a particular area that's of interest to us. All right, so now I'm going to cover three alternative research strategies, deductive research, inductive research, and descriptive research. So deductive research begins with a theory, test implications with data. So it's frequently used in conjunction 
with quantitative methods, you would start with a theory, and then collect data that would basically like help you to hypothesize test. So you're starting off with an already pre-existing theory of what's going to happen, and you would collect data to see whether or not your data actually conforms and helps you to prove that theory. So starting with a hypothesis, which is like a tentative statement about empirical reality, usually looking at relationships between multiple variables. So here's an example, higher poverty rate in a community, the higher percentage of community residents who are homeless. Um, that's a pretty easily testable hypothesis. We talk about variables as characteristics or properties that take on different values and attributes. So examples could be poverty rate, percentage of homelessness, community residents. The independent variable is a variable that is hypothesized to cause or lead to variation in another variable. So something that has an effect on a different variable. So in this example would be poverty rate. Higher poverty rate equals higher percentage of people who are in um, homelessness. And the dependent variable is the variable uh, that depends on the independent variable, which is percentage of community of residents who are homeless. So hopefully before I came into this class, you've heard of these terms before, but the text should help you to elaborate a little bit more, build your understanding of them. All right, so as opposed to hypothesis testing, inductive research collects data first. And then after collecting all that data, then you start to build hypotheses, typically more of like a qualitative focus. So if you think about deductive research, most of the time it's quantitative. You're trying to come up with numbers that would help you to test your theory or your hypothesis versus inductive. You might just be doing a lot of listening. You might be asking questions and open-ended questions, trying to figure out the context of somebody's life. And it helps you to get like a deeper, richer understanding of the, the research question that you might be posing or the person who you want to know more about what their life circumstances like. And lastly is descriptive research. Um, you're not really trying to prove any hypothesis or theory. You're just trying to describe a problem or describe a phenomenon. Sometimes you might have to do something like a descriptive research before doing any type of hypothesis testing. So it might just be to give you some face validity about the problem that you're in, in like trying to learn more about. And then based on your descriptive research, you might be able to then conduct further hypothesis testing or inductive or deductive research. So as we move through the semester, some other really important terms that we'll be discussing a little bit more in deep in depth is uh, measurement validity. Um, so when we're looking through these research articles, all the authors should be talking about validity and reliability of their measurement tools. So validity is in effect, the accuracy of a measure. Uh, so is it really measuring what we're intending to measure? Um, there's a few different types of validity, but ultimately they all kind of break down is whether or not what we're intending to measure is actually what we're measuring and not something completely different. So if you have a scale that's meant to measure the weight of something, we want to make sure that it's measuring the weight and that it's not measuring its temperature. So you could think of like a, using a thermometer to measure somebody's weight. Sure, if you're using the thermometer, it's going to give you reliable results and it's going to give you the same results every time, but it's not an accurate or really valid measure of somebody's weight. So you, you want to make sure your measurement's actually measuring what it's intended to measure. Um, generalizability, uh, sample generalizability, and cross-population generalizability. So when we're looking at the results of a paper and the implications of a sort of social science type of research paper, is it really generalizable across different populations and different cultures? Or is it really only, does this only exist within the vacuum of the research that was conducted? So when we're conducting research, we're definitely trying to make sure that, you know, there's as little noise in the data as possible and our studies are well controlled, but it's kind of pointless if you can't generalize your findings as well. But that's where generalizability is another important concept to consider. Causal validity, somebody might make a implication that correlation and causation are the same thing. If there's one thing that you walk away from this course knowing is that correlation and causation are not the same thing. So just because there's a relationship between two variables doesn't mean that one causes the other. So an example might be ice cream sales and violent crime. There's a strong correlation between violent crime and ice cream sales. And it has nothing to do with the amount of ice cream that people are eating that's causing them to be violent. But more along the lines that when it gets warmer outside, people will buy more ice cream. And also when it gets warmer outside, people tend to be outside more and see their neighbor that they don't get along with. 
or you know maybe have more social gatherings where there's alcohol involved and people become more irritable and more aroused when it's hot outside so that's would be more of cause of validity the heaping the factor that's causing both of these things to go up and authenticity your book talks a little bit more about the idea that the study of the focus of social science should be focused on how participants view the social world rather than developing the social scientist interpretation of the world so not just the person who's writing the paper but the people who are being the subjects of the study the belief that authenticity should really lie within the people being there the population being studied so some questions to come back to um, regarding measurement validity um, have we measured what we think we're measuring um, it's difficult to measure because especially in social science because of poorly defined phenomena um, definitions of phenomena change questions may result in inaccurate responses I would say that in my measurement course, um, Social Work 793, if some of you take it, the biggest challenge that students have in that course is coming up with what they're trying to measure. You would think that it would be easy to identify one variable that you want to change in your life, but typically the variables that people come up with are multifaceted um, and people really struggle with defining what problem that they're trying to address. And I feel like that's half the battle. So it really comes down to measuring what what people want to measure or defining what they're trying to measure or change. Regarding generalizability of a study's finding, um, so sample generalizability, you'll find that a lot of studies are conducted by universities working with university students, and that's because that sample is really, really easy to grab. A lot of times, you know, social science professors will grab students because they can give them extra credit and they'll participate versus trying to find a sample that's really maybe more challenging. And I mean, in my dissertation, I worked with adolescents in a psychiatric inpatient unit, which was an extremely difficult sample to get a hold of. And I can understand why there wasn't too much research done on it because of all the challenges that it came across with trying to get that kind of data uh, versus like a college student might be somebody who's 18 and easily willing to participate in a study. So. But does that mean that their results would transfer to somebody who's in a rural area or like a, um, a urban area? It prop maybe, maybe not. So that's why it's important to think about the generalizability of the study and whether or not the findings from one study can really generalize to other types of populations or samples. And just to elaborate on causal validity, again, correlation does not equal causation. Related but separate concepts. So just because two variables are strongly related doesn't mean that one causes the other and then just lastly to focus on authenticity is the idea that people who are the subjects of the study should be the ones who define the research and that social scientists should focus on how individuals perceive their world rather than their interpretations of how the individuals perceive the world